I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob. Yo. Today, we're looking at the fifth of our 10-part series. And the last until the dark night of Maoism falls, and we have to convince ourselves that, you know, certain things were great when they really weren't. Yeah, and the last one before 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 communism before takes nighttime. over. Yeah, before a period that even Chinese literary scholars themselves really don't study. Yeah. So, the 1940s. We don't need a great deal of historical background here, because even people who haven't read much about China... 40s are rough in China. <laughs> <laughs> of of I mean, if if all decades in the 20th century in China are violent, this is probably the most violent. Probably so, because you know I often talk to friends about this, but uh, for as much as countries like France and Germany just got annihilated during the the world the war, after the war they didn't then have a hyper violent civil war, which is what happened in China. So China goes from being invaded by Japan in the 30s to having World War II in the 40s to having a bloody civil war that ends in 1949. To be fair, the rest of Asia, pretty much everybody had a civil war right after World War II. I mean, fair enough. Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, all of them had, had civil wars. So China is not all that different in terms of its like what happened in, in the 1940s, but you know, just China's huge right and therefore it its war was huge so yes. we've got the japanese fighting in china they've invaded china they control much of the the main parts of the main metropolitan areas of china they control hong kong shanghai beijing uh much of nanjing obviously yeah, infamously north, north china particularly um the Communists have retreated to a base in North China. It's just a uh, you know a couple hours train ride north of Xi'an, or the the sort of heartland of the political of ancient political China. The KMT, that is the rightist, who claim to be the representatives of all of China, have retreated into the heart of the Yangtze River mm. area. Uh, but Shanghai is kind of it's controlled by the Japanese. Yeah. But it it sort of functions in this weird kind of way. This weird sort of sort of almost like a nether world, no yeah. man's land sort of place. And that's where my writer from this decade just kind of takes dominates. control. She and, dominates the And 1940s. I have to say it burns to say this, but I'm going to have to agree with you on this one and i say it burns because you and i have had so many arguments about the degree to which this writer is for you the greatest writer of the 20th century in china for me not so to agree with you on her in any sense feels it's it's rough man i, I want to argue on this one but i just can't i'm sorry rob but thank the, you for the writer sympathy. for this decade is Zhang Ailing. Um, in English, sometimes her name is Eileen Chang. Eileen Chang. Eileen Chang. Yeah, mm-hmm. her mother was actually fairly fluent in English, and so Zhang Eileen, uh famously actually wrote in both languages. Mm. Um, and her name, Eileen, she may have actually had a an English name before she had a Chinese name. Mm. Um, so Eileen might have actually been her original name, and Eileen. The Chinese version of that may have actually been interesting. Uh, second, yeah. mm-hmm. dairy. She oh. is. Um, I think there are a lot of writers in the European, American, Russian traditions to which you can compare her, like uh, a George Eliot, Jane Austen type, who use sometimes in sometimes very simple ideas like a romance but then goes somewhere very, very serious and very subtle with them. So, for example, one of the, perhaps her most famous work, Love in a Fallen City, is about a romance. Um, and it's about a romance in a war-torn city. So it takes place in Hong Kong just before and, and, and during, of course, the Japanese invasion. And if I were to tell you, this is about a love story that takes place in a war-torn city. What you would expect is, you know... Uh, midnight rendezvous at barricades under the watchful eyes of spotlights and things like that. That doesn't really happen. She's far more subtle than that. Uh, you don't actually get violence of any kind from this war until the, towards the very end of the work. Uh, and then, of course, you have the, the story that you and I have done 
I don't even know if anyone ever saw this, like a video version of a podcast that we did at the <laughs> university here. Anyway, University of Oregon, that is. On Shanghai during the, the Japanese occupation, just called Sealed Off, which is a brilliant story. It's quite Read a, it. It's quite a short story. Very it's short. very good. Um, it's, it's quite often anthologized. Yes, rightfully um, so. So Zhang Ailing is this weird figure. So you compared her both in, to, to the English writers Jane Austen That's just and, off the top of my head. and George Eliot. I think it's interesting because even though it's off the top of your head, Zhang Ailing is famous for being a woman as, <laughs> as, as, as are George Eliot and Jane Austen. Very true. And so, I, you know, I mean, we, we talked about this before. It, there is this danger of ghettoizing female writers right. as female oh, these are writers. female writers and if you want to learn about women's issues you and should like read them. Yeah. menstruation and things like that and caring well, about people and you know, families like real stereotypical sorts of things right which i, I think is is dangerous because it it asks us to treat Zhang Ailing and other female writers as if they're somehow outside of the normative tradition as though we're reading some kind of genre fiction like yeah. oh they're good for that kind of writing right 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 um, and I, I think Zhang Ailing, I've, I've made this claim again and again, and I'll make it here. I think Zhang Ailing is the greatest writer in, in the Chinese language in the 20th century. She is carrying on this tradition that is a pre-May 4th vernacular writing. She writes in a way that evokes the dream of the Red Chamber, mm. I would argue. Her, her language specifically, the words she uses. This is definitely not, uh, you know— Lu Xun or Hu or something Lu like Xun is actively trying to cut himself off from that pre-May well, not, 4th. Not ever really bring, being able to bring himself to do it. Yeah, sure. But his intention is to cut mm. himself off from May 4th. Have something new, yeah. Uh, the sort of Ezra Pound make it new thing. Right. Um, Zhang Ailing rejects that. And she 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 evokes this past tradition. She's very comfortable at right. using that tradition, which is strange because she's a at at one point. I mean, in one way, she's evoking this Chinese textual tradition that goes back several hundred years. I mean, she she's obviously familiar with a lot of the ancient texts, much more ancient than that. But in terms of her writing, she's evoking the the tradition of Dream of the Red Chamber. Yes. Which, I should point out, is also a quote-unquote romance sure. that is far more than a romance. Sure. Um, that's, that's absolutely true. And I think that she is also, Zhang Ailing is using that romance to get at questions uh, that are incredibly important. Yes. What is the individual's relationship with society? During the 1940s, when she's writing... Both people on the, and both writers on the left and right are saying you need to be writing about politics. And what's so fascinating is a, is that Zhang Ailing is saying no, I'm not going to write at all about politics. Yeah. She writes about Hong Kong as the Japanese are invading, and in that t entire story of love in a fallen city, I don't believe she once uses the word Japan Jap or that's Japanese. That's true. Yeah, you're right. And, and it's 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 fascinating because she's she's. Ex uh, implicitly putting a big middle finger up to the male writers who are saying you have to write about politics, both male writers on the in the KMT and in, in the Communist Party. Well, what's interesting, too, about her is it isn't that there's no politics in her writing. It's that she sets them in the background. So sure. they form the backdrop of whatever's happening on the main stage. So in Sealed Off, for example, it's clear that the subway or the the Whatever it is, the tram car? What is it? Tram, yeah. It's a tram car. It's not a subway. They don't have a subway then. Anyway, um, the tram car that's been cut off from a power outage, that's due, obviously, to some sort of war-related violence. But the fact that she doesn't foreground it, she just it's, it's like, oh, yeah, this is just the reason that this, this whole thing was able to happen. Uh, the, the actual people involved are far more important. And in some ways, that's the the more effective and more radical stance to take. Is look, war's going to come, war's going to going to go. People are still going to be eating their manto, their rice buns, on the train, always. Like that's always going to happen. So why don't we talk about that instead? Because that's what matters. Just a quick point for the listener: manto is not rice bun. Uh, manto is is made from wheat. You're referring to two different things, right? You're correcting me. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> You're right. I um, said rice bun. It looks like a rice bun because it's white. You typically think that. No. No, no one typically thinks that. You typically I typically think that. Think that. Um, so you referred, you compared her to Jane Austen, and I think that's interesting because I actually do think she writes in a way that evokes Jane Austen. She actually, uh, so so Zhang Ailing wrote one story called uh, Duo Xiao Hun, um, uh, To Hate So Much, or I don't know how to translate it. I don't think it actually, that story I don't think has been translated, but it actually evokes she she is explicitly modeling Zhang Ailing is explicitly modeling her st- story on Jane Eyre. Mm. So Zhang Ailing is very familiar with the the English novel tradition. So she is evoking Jane Eyre um, in that Du Xiao Hun story. But uh, for Jane Austen, Jane Austen is a fascinating figure because one of the things that she does is she's writing during the Napoleonic era about, uh, 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 not Napoleonic things. Right. (laughs) So, so all of her novels, like men, particularly military men are supposed to kind of figure as the main heroic figures. But what's interesting is all of these, these men in uniform who appear in Jane Austen's novels are kind of, tertiary they're they're in the background and they're there and you know that the war is going on but jane austen is explicitly rejecting any discussion of heroics and military for this emphasis on the quote-unquote feminine on the family on marriage on love Mm -hmm. and it's this assertion of the individual's right to be an individual over these categories of the nation she's not talking jane austen is not talking about guy stuff and heroic stuff she's talking about people and that's what makes her so important and i think in that way you can see a lot of similarities to jai right. ling and you're also seeing something here that you will not see again for quite some time which is commercial success and critical success uh there are very successful writers and translators in the, at the beginning of the 20th century in china that are later thrown under the wheels of the bus by the May 4th movement and others by saying, well, they're basically just sellouts, right? They're just trying to make a buck. Uh, Even though a lot of the May 4th writers were also making bucks doing the same thing. Anyway, um, Lu Xun, for all that I think he's just an absolutely stupendous writer, didn't make a lot of money off his writings. No one was reading Wild Grass in the 20s. No one was paying for it. No one's buying Wild Grass. Like, no way. Uh, the 30s, I would say more people are, are reading Shi Zizun and Lao Shu, but again, they're not you know they're not like moving into mansions or stuff with their with their literature. So you're still seeing kind of a split between popular and critical readers. Zhang Ailing is kind of the final movement of this in that she brings both together. Zhang Ailing, even today, is hugely popular. Uh, not that everyone's running out to the stores to buy her books, but there are lots of people are. I mean, lots of people are, huge. but I mean, so she's not like putting out new bestsellers or anything like that. But, well, I mean, she's dead, but I agree. You know, I know, I know what you mean. But the, the point simply being that people read her. People read Hong Lomo and Dream of Red Chambers, right, for very similar reasons, just as they read Jane Austen. People and, are buying these things. And she, yeah, she is one of the best-selling authors in the 20th century. Right. Uh, I would I would put an asterisk by that point that you made of both commercial and critical success. Uh, she does not actually have that much critical success right off critical, the bat. Critical, no, no, you're right, critical waits um, a while, but... She in the 1940s is considered just a popular writer, mm. and uh, in the 1950s, of course, the communists say <laughs> they they despise her. In fact, even to this day, yeah, uh, the the Communist Party will not allow a Zhang Ailing museum to be built in China. They have uh, kind of quietly put out orders that you can't have a Chinese mu- a museum dedicated to her as a writer, which is strange because I think Lucian has like. 10 a million. museums yeah, something like that. um and and most other chinese writers also have at least one museum to their name so the 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 guy who kind of invents the study of modern chinese literature both, in the west anyway we don't know in in, in anywhere mm. is his name is ct shy and he uh he is studying in the U.S. when the communists take over he's very ct shy is very anti-communist he uh writes his i think he writes his dissertation on byron if i remember correctly Hmm. but he eventually becomes a scholar 
uh, he becomes slotted in slotted. <laughs> you almost said slaughtered. He becomes slotted into the study of Chinese literature, even mm. though his background is actually in English literature, as so often happens for right. for Chinese American scholars. Um, and C. T. Shaw actually says that she may be one of the great writers mm. of the 20th century. And because he's the guy who essentially founds the study of modern Chinese literature in in the U.S. and even in China, he's one of the most important figures, uh, he he has this outsized influence. And so right. Zhang Ailing becomes a critical success because of C.T. Shaw, but otherwise, I don't. I don't think people, critics, would have been taking him seriously, even right. though she's this best-selling author. I, my, my, that was kind of my my point was that at the time she was. I think since we're looking backwards, uh, it's interesting to see that right before the curtain draws shut is when you see a truly skilled, really skilled writer writing stuff that everyone wants to read. Um, and that people are still reading. And people are still reading. 70 years I mean, I lived. love Lu Xun, but I, I lived in China now for a, quite a while. have lived in China. I'm not living there now. But for quite a while, I don't know many Chinese people who just chill out and read Lu Xun. Like even, I know I have friends from grad school from when I was at Nankai who would, but no one else would, yeah. right? But they will read Zhang Ailing. And what's fascinating, of course, is you read this and... You can study this. You can teach this. You can write about it. It's brilliant writing, and it's popular. Yeah. Um, and it is important because this is like I, I, we get a little melodramatic about the curtain drawing shut, the, the night falling, or whatever. But um, she's writing in a period when when you just mentioned you're not supposed to be writing about you know people on a, on a little tram car just being themselves, right? You're supposed to write about how evil the Japanese are, or how great the Chinese military is, or some version of that. Um, and she's not doing that. And she's one of the last people for probably 30, three, 30 decades, three decades, uh, who makes any kind of commercial impact doing that. I mean, once you get to the 80s, that starts to shift again. And certainly now it's different. But uh, for quite a while, this is it. This is the last gasp before commercial literature is communist literature yeah and for the next three decades the writing that is above ground anyway above ground is largely stuff that no one wants to read no, today no so Jiang Ailing is really the end for this a while the end. yeah this is the end my only we should see if we can splice some doors in <laughs> um, um so yeah we would it's gonna it's a less dynamic conversation when it's sort of just a love fest about one writer but Sorry seriously about that. read Zhang Ailing if, if if you're if you're if you're thinking to yourself I I should read some of what they're talking about uh if I was only gonna hand pick about three writers on this whole discussion thing we're doing Zhang Ailing would definitely be one of them and there are quite a few there are, I think three fairly good English translations yes of Zhang Ailing's yeah. work, um, Love and lo, uh, Half a Half a Lifetime Romance is the novel that has just in the past few years been translated. Ban mm. Ban Zhengyuan is the the Chinese original name of it, um, and then there's Love in a Fallen City and something else. And then of course, you look through Chinese literature anthologies, you're yeah. almost modern literature anthologies, you're almost sure to find at least one of her stories. Definitely, there will be sealed off. Yeah, that story we referred to. Well, I think that's a good place to end it, Rob. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. <laughs>